reading from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 to 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Welcome to worship. Uh, I'm so glad that you are here with us today. We do have a few announcements uh, on the, uh, in the bulletin that I want to lift up. There is, right after this service today, a mini concert uh, at 1215 that... Um, Diane Allard is uh, leading, singing in that concert, and, and Carol is accompanying her. It's going to be great. It's about maybe 20 minutes long, 15? 15. 15, something like that. We started these during the pandemic, and they were all online, and we had such a great response to them. We're starting to offer them after worship in person, and then if you aren't here in person, you can also watch it online. So um, it's going to be fantastic, and I hope you're, you're planning to stay for that. Uh, if you are planning to attend Dave Carlson's memorial service, which is happening on November 7th here in the sanctuary at 1 o'clock, um, there's a link in your bulletin to RSVP. The family is collecting RSVPs, so they are sure they are not exceeding the number uh, that we're allowing in the sanctuary. Don't let that deter you from signing up to come, uh, but it, they just need to know. So uh, please uh, do respond. Um, there, we're looking for a couple of chaperones for the youth retreat, uh, so re reach out to Stuart if you can do that. Um, I want to uh, let you know two weeks out that on October 24th, which is the weekend of the ch church retreat, uh, we will be having only one worship service that day, and it will be at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, we have a number of families who have signed up to go to the retreat. We're very excited about that. Uh, but it means that we probably won't have numbers here to support two services, so we will be having only the one uh, at 10 o'clock here in the sanctuary with uh, Carol leading. So anyway, uh, and uh, Bill Dabney will be preaching uh, at that service here, so um, you don't want to miss it. If you're not going on the treat, you want to come and hear Bill Dabney because um, he's wonderful. Uh, also, we're updating the church directory, so if you've moved or you've changed email or you've changed phone number, uh, call the church office and let us know. And um, I want to ask right now, if you're walking in the crop walk uh, next Saturday, would you stand? Okay. Now, it's, it's, it's not for applause. It's to say, if you didn't stand or raise your hand, go to the Trinity Trekkers website and, and support me and Donna. <laughs> you know, because we're walking next Saturday. Uh, and we want to, um, you know, raise a lot for uh, um, hunger, and we want you to help us. All right. Um, there are other things, but I know that um, you will read them. Thank you again for being here for worship today. A reading from Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 31. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not defraud, Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all of those since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, 
and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it will be for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were perplexed at these words. But Jesus said to them again, children, how hard it is to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. They were greatly astounded and said to one another, then who can be saved? Jesus looked at them and said, For mortals it is impossible, but not for God. For God all things are possible. Peter began to say to him, Look, we have left everything and followed you. Jesus said, Truly I tell you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for my sake and for the sake of the good news who will not receive a hundredfold now in this age, houses, brothers and sisters, mothers and children, and fields with persecutions, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last, and the last will be first. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, for you are our strength and our redeemer. And may the gospel be more to us than mere words. May the Holy Spirit produce in us strong conviction. Amen. Today's reading from the Gospel of Mark tells of an encounter between Jesus and a rich man who comes to him with a question. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This story, which appears in various forms in all three synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is one of the most challenging Jesus moments to wrap our hearts and minds around. The man who kneels before the master is earnest, open-hearted in spite of the fact that most of the people listening would think he already has everything he needs. He has been taught well, knows the law, and by his own appraisal is living it, keeping every rule. He has wealth enough to fulfill other requirements too, like tithing and giving alms that he is even coming to Jesus thinking that he has something more to learn is a peek into his character. He truly wants to please God. If that is a different characterization than you have heard before concerning this rich, rich seeker, you are not alone. Generations of biblical scholars in their efforts to manage this text have painted him as a grasper who sees what Jesus is offering as just one more thing he can obtain, salvation as just one more possession to be owned. It's a pretty good way of managing the text, because <laughs> we get so caught up in the audacity of this rich man to think he can buy his way into the kingdom of heaven, that we can sweep to the side the outrageously extreme demand that Jesus makes of him. Sell everything you have, and give the money to the poor, and then come, follow me. And if you manage the text by saying that Jesus' words weren't for everyone, just for this one person who had a particularly difficult time with making an idol out of wealth, then you can gloss right over what Jesus said. Sell everything you have, and give the money to the poor, and then come, follow me. And if you manage the text by saying, Jesus didn't mean it, not really, not that you must sell everything. If you manage it by saying it was hyperbole or simply said for shock value, you don't have to think too hard about what it might mean that Jesus said, sell everything you have and give the money to the poor and then come follow me. And for the record, I do think Jesus said it for shock value. How terribly shocking for this man who had thought of himself as a righteous, godly man for so long 
to discover that when push came to shove, he loved his stuff more than eternal life. How shocking. This is a text to be read with care. It's a story that provides a lot of details but leaves a lot of unanswered questions, all of which can help us as we allow this encounter to speak to us and to our generation. One of the unanswered questions of the story is whether the man is overstating his ability to keep the commandments. Again, this text has often been managed by questioning the character of the man. He is not righteous, but self-righteous, too sure of himself, lying or in denial. But Jesus says nothing about that. Jesus holds the commandments up as a high standard and accepts at face value the man's assertion that he has lived up to that standard. But go back to the very first words Jesus says to the rich man. Why do you call me good? From the start of this encounter, Jesus sets up the question of whether being good or following the rules is enough. A second unanswered question of the story is why is it difficult for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven? Jesus doesn't say precisely. <laughs> is it a false sense of self-sufficiency, the idea that you don't need anybody else? Does that false sense of security lead you to also deny your need for God? Is it that wealth shields you from the everyday needs and even the suffering of other people? Maybe being insulated like that causes you to lose an important piece of your humanity. The understanding that we are all connected and at a fundamental level dependent upon one another. Could it be that Focus, by focusing on the rules, the rich man has missed out on something far more important in the kingdom of God. Maybe it is not about rules, but about relationship. A third unanswered question is, what is the one thing the rich man lacks? Maybe Jesus is asking him to risk everything for the faith he has so carefully practiced. If he has studied scripture, he surely knows that the prophets called for hearts turned toward justice and compassion for the poor. Maybe Jesus is asking him to take on poverty, both literally regarding his worldly possessions and figuratively in his desire to please God. Maybe it is a call to be one who receives rather than one who gives and to practice trusting that God will provide for his basic needs. What are we to take away about what God desires from us? One way of tackling all these unanswered questions is to pay close attention to the details of the story and see what they open up for us. The first detail to notice is that Jesus and his disciples are on the way when this man approaches them. The NRSV said, on a journey, but that's not the correct interpretation. On the way is correct. And these words are a signal in the gospel that they are headed toward Jerusalem, where Jesus will ultimately give everything, his very life, in order that the world might know God's heart and trust God more deeply. Jesus is headed to the cross to show in his very body that God can be trusted in life and in death, even when evil rages and even when it seems all hope is lost. Jesus is already thinking in these terms. And so what he asks the, of the rich man is the same thing he asked two of his disciples who wanted to be seated in the kingdom. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Are you able to die to self and rise again to new life? A second detail in the story is that the man kneels before Jesus. Everywhere else in the Gospel of Mark, when someone kneels before Jesus, they are seeking to be healed or for the healing of someone else. Is this a healing story? 
Is Jesus' demand that the rich man give away his possessions the only way to address what has become for him an illness as much as anything else? Has gathering possessions taken control of his life to such an extent that everything else has been crowded out or that he doesn't even know who he is anymore without all that stuff? Does he need to be set free on some level in order to truly live? There are many details in this story, but the final one I want to point out is that the rich man is not asked simply to give away his wealth, but he is asked to give it to the poor. This, again, points to the interconnectedness of the human family by indicating that there is a relationship between his wealth and the poverty others experience. If Jesus is giving the rich man a prescription for what ails him, it is a prescription that includes what to give up, but also what to embrace. I frequently read posts by Joshua Becker, a blogger who writes about minimalism, the intentional move toward owning less for the good of the world and for your own mental and spiritual health. One of his recent articles was entitled, All the Things I Want to Say About Money But Never Do. <laughs> the article begins with four vignettes. Becca writes, Recently, I was with a friend who was complaining to me she couldn't afford to replace her cell phone. We were in her newly purchased Toyota Highlander at the time. On a separate occasion, an acquaintance of mine was lamenting that he didn't know where he was going to find the money to buy new shock soccer cleats for his son this summer. We were, at the time, enjoying dinner at a nice restaurant. Similarly, another friend recently told me he was unable to financially donate to a cause when I asked. He assured me he wanted to help and really wished he could, but they had just put a pool in the backyard and were using every spare dime to pay it off. Still again, I sat chatting with a friend, complaining of the overtime hours he had been putting in at work. They were trying to finally get out from under debt they had been carrying for years. Meanwhile, his fa Facebook feed brags of the season tickets he had just purchased for his favorite Major League Baseball team. Each time I bit my tongue, I wanted to share what was on my mind, but I didn't. One way of looking at the story of Jesus and the rich man is that Jesus didn't bite his tongue. <laughs> Jesus said what we are often afraid to say or admit to ourselves. Sometimes you have to choose between one thing or another. Sometimes you have to set aside one thing in order to pursue more fully a goal or way of life that will ultimately be of more value. Here, Becker <laughs> invited his readers to envision that move with a series of dichotomous statements. I want to get out of debt, so I will spend less on eating out. I want more money for travel, so I will spend less on housing. I want more margin for generosity, so I must spend less on fashion, furniture, or technology. Becker's article made me think about life choices and the way Jesus invited the rich man to let go of something, his possessions, and also embrace something else, generosity toward and solidarity with the poor. Those things were related in the same way many of our daily choices affect us in ways we can't see or admit to ourselves. The rich man in this story is not asking for a ticket to heaven, by the way. He is asking how he can experience heaven on earth, how he can be part of making heaven on earth a reality. Jesus is inviting the rich man to see the correlation between his desire for a more fulfilling faith journey, a true experience of the world as God desires it to be, and the choices he is making that prevent those very things from coming to be.
Living out our faith commitment is challenging. And we, like the rich man, are prone to turn away when we are asked to give away or give up things we value. This story is a reminder that there are attachments we might need to let go of in order to live more fully into God's reign. Part of being a community in Christ is being a place where we can ask the question, what must we do in response to the illnesses of our society and in response to our individual need for healing? Here in this community, I am grateful that we have an environmental justice team that is asking, what must we do individually and as a church to affect broader change toward a cleaner and greener world? We will have to let go of some things and embrace other things to experience the healing God desires for the planet and its inhabitants. I am grateful that we have a racial justice ministry that is asking, what must we do individually as a church to affect broader change toward racial justice? We will have to let go of some things and embrace other things to experience the healing God desires in this area of our collective life. I am grateful for the work of our mission and service ministry in asking, what must we do to affect broader change towards social and economic equality? We will have to let go of some things and embrace other things to experience the healing God desires for people at both ends of the economic spectrum. One of the details of this story that stands out to me is that Jesus knew what the rich man was asking without having it spelled out. <laughs> he looked at him and loved him, the story tells us. He looked at him and saw everything about him, his devotion, his questions, his discomfort with the life he was living, his desire for more, a different relationship with other people, a deeper experience of his own humanity, a deeper experience of God. And Jesus loved him as he loves us and our questions and our searching. A source of questioning for me over these past few months is what to do about social media. I have been on Facebook for a long time now and on Instagram off and on too. It is troubling to me how those platforms have contributed to the divisions in our nation and to the spreading of misinformation that has cost lives during the pandemic. I am distressed to know the ways social media brings harm to vulnerable people and communities by exploiting human weaknesses for profit. I don't know what a company like TikTok can do to weed out people who are putting illegal and dangerous challenges out on that platform, or the fact that these challenges are harming people in real life. And that's kind of the point. I know there's a good side to social media. As well as the rich man who came to Jesus knew that his money could be used for good and undoubtedly was sometimes used for good. But where do you draw the line? That's what I keep asking myself. Where does the illness of social media become more potent than the good? I haven't even addressed how it affects my own psychological well-being. And we all know that's a piece of it, too. My question coming out of this story today is this. If I am being called to let go of social media, then what are the new ways I will stay connected with people? How am I being called to more human, more authentic relationship with people that is right now not possible because I am way too wed to this way of relating and staying in touch? spending way too much time on this way of relating and staying in touch. I know from this story that the call to discipleship is not only about what is given up, but about the newness that comes and is to be embraced. I honestly don't know what I'm going to do about social media, <laughs> but I'm sitting in a place of discomfort right now about these things. And I'm sharing it with you because I don't know what your area of discomfort is and what you are struggling with in these days. But I know 
that this is a community where we can talk about whatever it is and ask the honest question, what must I do? What must we do together? What is the path for healing? The path that takes us closer and closer to the kingdom of God. Amen. As we come to the time of prayer, I invite you to find the Joys and Concerns page, uh, which was in the email you received from Trinity this morning, uh, or in the bulletin. I do have a joy that was handed to me this morning. Uh, Marilyn is asking us to share her joy uh, on the wedding of Grace and Jake uh, in Illinois. Uh, Grace is uh, her oldest grandniece. 
and she notes that they uh, chose the date of the wedding uh, because it was the birthday of the bride's uh, great-grandfather, which is very nice. Uh, we are also uh, celebrating that both Wolf and Anne Marie are doing better, uh, and so we continue to pray for them and rejoice that they are both responding well to treatment. Uh, we are, um, have a new concern on our prayer, our prayer list for Joan, who is a, a friend of Donna's, uh, with a recent cancer diagnosis. Uh, we are praying for Mark and his family on the death of his father, Bruno. Um, and we are um, holding uh, all of us, a community, uh, the events that happened at, at Washington Liberty High School. Uh, thankfully, there was not a shooter but what that event brought to us is, you know, the remembrance that no parent wants to get that email and no child wants to be at school not knowing uh, if it's real or not real. And for a while there, nobody knew. And so the question, um, I mean, I think we just hold that in our prayers and know that, that it affected students and families and um, staff. Um, and, and we continue to hold that. Uh, we're in prayer for Bill uh, with late stage cancer and for Mary Alice in treatment and for Tracy in treatment and um, for Diana, uh, who is uh, Dave's mother uh, with advanced dementia and for Andrea, Robert's sister, uh, who has cancer, uh, for Rosanna, uh, Shakti's friend and for Mary, uh, Jim and Susan's friend and neighbor. There are other names on our prayer list and I try to lift different ones uh, each week, but I ask that you find time to read all the way through it and um, remember all of those um, that we are holding in our prayers. Let us pray. Source of life, gather us into your presence and hold us in love. May we be mindful of the beauty and abundance that surrounds us and open to receive the blessings of this day. May we trust in your love and respond to your presence, even when your call cuts against our expectations, wants, or plans. Open us to compassion that seeks your way of love, justice, inclusion, and provision for all. We come before you, patient God, opening our hearts to your way and will. Despite all the things that can get in the way, we know we can trust you. In times when things overcome us, clear us set us on right footing. In times when we are overwhelmed by hopelessness, refresh us. In times when we are exas exasperated by injustice, renew our passion. Send your presence in our hurting world, O oh God, that all people may know that no matter what they face, they do not face it alone. You have not abandoned us. You are near. Be especially near to those who are sick or who suffer this day. We lift to you now the ones who are on our prayer list. And those whose needs were on our hearts when we came to worship. Be near to us, O oh God, as we seek to live into your kingdom. Give us the gift of discernment when we are faced with many competing voices and in current concerns of this generation, this time. Help us avoid the temptation to stick our heads in the sand because it is too difficult or too confusing. Look on us lovingly and give us clarity when we ask, what must we do? Help us to pray as Jesus taught us that your kingdom might be established here and now. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I um, invite you now to a moment in worship when we consider our stewardship, and particularly our stewardship to Trinity Presbyterian Church. Uh, there are many ways to respond. Uh, you can do that through the Trinity website, to the church office, using the text to give uh, option. Uh, and I want to again say how grateful we are for your continued support of the ministry of this church. Thank you. Um, would you stand for the singing? Um, and the first hymn is number 307, 307, God of Grace and God of Glory.
difficult questions are you dealing with in these days? Our tendency when things get uncomfortable is to distract ourselves or to figure out some other way to dull the uncomfortable feeling. That is true in communities as well as for individuals. This week, if you are feeling uncomfortable about your life, about some aspect of your life that is keeping you from being as faithful as you might be, I invite you to sit with the discomfort. What are the questions that emerge? What do you think God is trying to say to you with this discomfort? This week, sit with the hard questions. And may the grace, mercy, and peace of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you this day and forevermore. Amen.